My name is Bill Hambrecht. I have been in the investment business since actually 1958 and um, have basically focused most of my career on financing uh, reasonably young uh, technology and disruption-based companies. Uh, and it's been a wonderful experience because it, by definition, these are some of the most exciting, unusual companies in the country today. And for example, in our first fund, the two real successes that built our reputation and allowed us to raise more money for other people were investments in both Apple and Genentech. And since then, we've moved on into the software business and Adobe and a number of others, Netscape. And so we've been involved in a lot of the very seminal, early groundbreaking companies in the United States. I went down to Florida uh, in 1958 and basically went to the east coast of Florida, Melbourne, where Cape Canaveral was being built and developed. And that's where the first UNIVAC computers were being built. And I had the great fortune of getting to know and really building a great relationship with two or three of the really early pioneers in the, in the computer field. And so that got me going. I, I never understood the physics or, the, or the, some of the algorithmic kind of things they were trying to explain to me. But somehow or other, where they were trying to go made sense to me. And so I just signed, a, signed on to the, the idea that this was fundamentally something very different, very profound, and would have great impact on the world today. My role evolved over a period of time in that initially I just respected and was intrigued by these people so much I figured my role was raise them some money. <laughs> and, 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 and I essentially didn't know an awful lot about it, but because it was so new, I knew more of it than anybody else did. I remember our original business plan uh, which we scribbled on a night flight on the way home, was if we could find five companies that we could, in, that we could invest in over the first five years and provide the financing for it, we would have a very successful small investment bank. You know, after, I think, the final analysis, I think we were over 500 investments and in underwritings 30 years later. You have to be exposed to really brilliant people. And, and we were so lucky to, to have people like Bob Noyes and Steve Jobs and people like that that, you know, now people look on them as icons. Hey, in those days, you know, these were the guys you kind of went out and had a beer with. There were really about three or four seminal events where I was involved with Steve in his initial IPO, in the Pixar IPO. We crisscrossed on three or four things that all worked very well. And, look, I loved the guy. I thought he was, uh, he was a great... Uh, you know, a great uh, visionary. Uh, you know, it was funny. Uh, Walter Isaacson summarizes the book by saying, you know, Steve wasn't the smartest guy in the room, but he was a genius. And I told Walter later, I said, you know, I would disagree with that. I think Steve was the smartest guy in the room and was great at recognizing genius in others. That was what he really did well. The problem that the venture capital community and entrepreneurs face today is that uh, there's been very little access to the public markets for the past 10 years. You know, the, there's some statistics that are really sobering and uh, uncomfortable every time I look at them. Uh, for example, the, the number of publicly reporting companies in the United States has gone from nine, over 9,000 to under 5,000. So there's enormous shrinkage in the number of public companies. We now have some efforts going to try and make it simpler and less costly to go public in, say, a $20 or $30 million offering, which is more than enough for 95% of these companies. Normally, that fixes their balance sheets forever. Uh, you know, people forget, you know, the initial public offering for Intel was around $5 million. The initial public offering for Adobe was one of the great successes in 1986 was $6 million. Microsoft 
went public for $30 million. Open IPO uh, differs from a traditional underwriting process, I think, in two basic principles. The first is that the price is set by the marketplace. Uh, in our system, the way it works is you start with the highest bid and you count down to the last share that you want to sell. In other words, if you want to sell a million share, the bid given for the millionth share becomes the clearing price for the transaction. And so everybody who bids that price or higher gets it at the clearing price. And this is, I think, the most effective way of price discovery. The second part, though, which is even more important, is that it's open to any broker-dealer in the United States who is willing to vouch for an account who says, I want to make a bid. So in its effect, open to everybody. When we first announced the auction process and when we had our first successful auction, I got a call from uh, a person that I knew well who was with one of the major bulge firms. The three dominant bulge underwriting firms are Morgan Stanley, uh, Goldman Sachs, and uh, at that time, First Boston Credit Suisse. And he said, you know, he said, I just don't understand this. He said, you know, we've known you for years. We've worked with you for years on all the traditional underwritings at Hambrickton Quist. He said, why are you doing this to us? He said, I thought you were one of us. And that bothered me because uh, I respected him. And I finally called him back and I said, you know, uh, I'm afraid I have to admit I'm not one of you anymore. I've, I've been out in Silicon Valley too long. And in Silicon Valley, when a new technology comes along that allows you to do something different and cheaper and better, you do it. That's, that's what innovation is all about. And, and I think that way now. I don't think in Wall Street terms anymore. The great companies are started with a sense of mission that's not measured in time or money. I think the great companies are set up to be permanent and, and long-term successful growth companies. Uh, that's what we always look for. I, I think that, to me, is the cardinal principle. If you do it for money, that doesn't mean you won't be successful. But there will be times during your growth phase where you will be offered a lot of money for your company. And if you do it for money, you, you, you might take it. What worries me today is that there are so many companies that don't have the option to go public and stay independent. Because if they don't do that, they are going to be pressured to sell. And, you know, companies that sell into a consolidation company, it, it's, a, it's a net job loss. And, and, and they lose their soul. They lose their sense of being. They lose their, their sense of drive and their, their sense of mission. It just becomes another product line. I think, number one, I try to encourage the... Uh, the creation of real risk money. Uh, by that, I mean the guy who will really put up some money behind an idea and not later. Uh, there are a number of ways of doing it. But, you know, I think more money in the hands of people that are willing to take a risk is better than just a lot more money in an institutionalized framework. Because I do think it's the risk tolerance thing that, that, that basically regulates how much money is really going to go into startups. Secondly, uh, as I say, I would figure out how to get them access to the public market as soon as possible. And uh, to ensure that they can really go to their full potential. Thirdly, I guess... I try to figure out a way of minimizing some of the non-technology costs that go into a startup. For example, one of the rules that I use, I have sort of my own entrepreneurial rules. One of them is don't spend any money on marketing until you have the product. And, you know, the, the same thing would be true is how do you get the legal work done in an economic way? How do, you, how do you set up the right accounting systems? Because if you don't do those things right in the beginning, sometimes you never catch up. Philosophically, when I think about what's important in the venture capital industry, I've come over a period of time to be a great believer in uh, 
the value of an idea. When we look at a venture, the first thing is we really have to have a methodology to be able to try and judge how strong the idea is and how sustainable the idea is. Uh, then, of course, you move on to you've got to get the money. But as I say, you know, generally, most of these great ideas don't need a lot of money. It really hurts me when I see some of these younger companies that have done a really good job sell out. Because no matter how you call it, no matter how you call it, it's the end of a business. And, and I think that's a shame. I always believed in being the low-cost producer. I never liked a business that was selling a product that cost more than the other product and basically the success was based on pure marketing. You know, I always felt that the value added ought to be there. And so I, I had a natural predilection for people that kept lowering the cost, making it simpler, making it better.